Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the scientific art of return on investment. And it's uh, that time, end of the month, uh, September is in the books. And so we're going to talk about the performance of Crassus Investments. And uh, apologies for focusing always on the fund, but that's the main focus at the moment. Eventually, uh, I hope to build this channel out into a little bit more broad base where we talk about all things. So we haven't even touched on real estate, for example, uh, and I would like to get some guests on the show too. But uh, focusing on uh, what's what, and the, the main point at the moment, the main focus will be the uh, investment fund. And so hence why we're spending so much time going through the positions in the uh, portfolio. I have received requests for some stocks that aren't in the portfolio and people that uh, would like me to review them and give my thoughts. I'll get to them, I promise, okay? But it might take a little bit of time. Okay, so the first things first, technically it's the end of the calendar quarter, okay, if you go by the calendar year. However, uh, it's not truly the case that it's a quarterly report. And I've said this before, in July, there was a problem organizing the paperwork with ET. Toro, so I only got to trade on I think the last, literally the last trading day of July, and uh, I got marked, uh, and it was the the portfolio was marked down two percent because of the bid ask spread. Okay, when you when you buy, so that's very annoying, and I really hate it. Um, but it's in the books, uh, so July is not should not be counted because we weren't trading, and then we had uh, August, so that was a decent month, um, fairly flat overall. We avoided the volatility. And you can see my monthly review on that one. And September's now in the books. And of course, with the, the end of the month coming up, we've gone from up 1.6 to down. Uh, I think it'll end up around the 2% mark. And so it's a little bit frustrating, but nonetheless, um, it's we've actually outperformed. And that's going to be a key theme that I need you guys to get your head around. So although well, it says quarterly, it's really like two months and one day. Anyway, in order to keep uh, consistent with the calendar year, I've decided just to do it as a quarterly, and um, I'm sure you guys will be able to forgive me for that. So outperform, why am I so happy when the fund will finish probably down 2.3% on the month? First of all, short term, don't think short term, uh, but you've always got to compare to the benchmarks, okay? So if we compare what happened in global markets, the S&P 500 is our benchmark. The S&P 500 is down, okay, not up. There should be a negative sign there. It was down 4.8% on the month. Other indices were performed even worse than that. So we have smashed the benchmark, absolutely smashed it out of the park. The problem is people don't generally get excited about it because it's on the downside. But that is absolutely where you need to be fanatical about managing your investments is managing the downside. If you take uh, less downside and more upside that is the holy that is literally the holy grail of investing and that's generating alpha in this case we're generating alpha on the way down but make no mistake about it it's still generating alpha and your portfolio manager is earning their stripes by generating alpha whether it's on the way up or whether it's on the way down when we look at our performance versus the other top three uh, PIs in the eToro, so you know the question for you as a potential investor you're thinking to yourself well why do I invest with one person over the other, over the other? So I think the top three guys who I follow, these are their returns for the month. So one was down negative uh, 5.17, ne uh, another negative 4.58, and another who is very, very famous and has 70, oh, I would not say that because that'll tell you who it is, but has a lot of money under management, very good. I have a huge amount of respect for him. And he was down almost 4%, so negative 3.99 we outperform not only bench the benchmark but also the guys who i believe are the best so so far so good everything is going to plan and we still hold uh, just over two percent in cash so we could have been fully invested and that might have improved our performance but our cash is sitting there and we're using it as a bit of dry powder to um, to deploy if and when we uh, i find opportunities that i deem fit Best performer for the month, CF Industries, bang, out of the gate. Urea is going through the roof. Uh, we've got cost push inflation, food price inflation. I've spoken about this many months ago, uh, and that was a key reason why we're positioned uh, in certain energy stocks and uh, CF Industries as a major fertilizer producer. 
interesting thing. We were down about 5% on the position initially. And I was like, oh, it's a big part of the position, makes over 5% of the funds under management, allocated to CF Industries. We were down and look what happens, okay? Forget price for just a second, focus on value, focus on the long term, forget the short term, and the valuations will mean revert. The market, as Benjamin Graham said, in the short term is a voting machine and in the long term it's a weighing machine. We want to find that quality and over time things will weigh out in our favour. Worst performer was one of our biggest positions was Royal Mail Group, okay? And I've done a video answering all the questions around that. I am not concerned one bit about Royal Mail Group, at least um, at this point in time. None of the fundamentals have changed and so... Um, I have about one more percent that I could allocate and build out the position a little more, but I'm just waiting to see. I, I may buy a little bit more on the downturn, or we may just sit back and wait. The stock pays us 5.7% as a dividend yield to wait. So, you know, I'm pretty happy just to, to sit there. I think the stock is worth at least eight pounds. It's currently trading at four pounds, 17 pounds, I believe. So we could have nearly a double on our hands, getting paid uh, nearly 6% yield to sit on our asses and wait. So I'm more inclined to do that. We'll keep an eye on it and see how we go. This is very important. So I've taken some slides from the first video ever on, on the fund and put together what it is that I'm trying to achieve here. We're trying to build a machine that protects capital, number one. So we protected capital uh, on the downside. If you were, you know, your, your pension or your superannuation here in Australia, just invested in index funds, then you know you're you're down. You're down more than fifty three percent of what we are. We've captured much much less of the downside, uh, and we're aiming to grow that at an outperformance over time. So twenty percent compounded annual growth rate. Now it doesn't mean it grows twenty percent every year. Okay, this is what you got to get your head around. It means that if we take the the end position minus the initial position, and then um, plug it in over the amount of time periods, okay, to the power of time periods, and we discount it over the 20 years, let's say, we would expect an annualized average return, which is not the same thing as an average return, of 20%, which means that you're doubling your capital over, um, you know, every three years approximately, a little over three years. So think about where we are, okay? This is what we're looking for. This is what we want to achieve. We're not even at year one, okay? So if you follow the cursor there on the charts, what I've said here is a $10,000 initial investment. And if you only put in $200 a month, I need to change that because $200 a month now won't properly uh, sync with a portfolio. You need to put in 500, um, but you can put 200 in if that's all you got. Every month, okay, I'm sure that just about anyone could find that, put it in every month and not miss it, okay, not be living off ramen for the rest of your life. And if you just let that do its thing over time and if you have confidence in the portfolio manager and they do what they're supposed to do and or the market permits, you end up with um, $831,427.20 at the end of year 20, okay, which is uh, a phenomenal performance. The last thing we're looking to do is outperform the S&P 500. Yes, we uh, so we smashed the S&P 500. It's just that we won't be making good headlines. It's not good clickbait to say we went down less than the S&P 500. No, <laughs> what you'll hear is fund manager beats S&P 500 by you know 10%, okay? But they usually talk about the upside. Make no mistake about it, alpha is alpha, and we have generated alpha, um, albeit on the downside, uh, for this month. Here's a very important chart that I would highly recommend you get uh, your head around and then tattoo it on your brain, as the saying goes. It comes from the legendary investor Howard Marks, okay? I've left a, a link here that you guys can uh, read a lot of his articles. They are absolute gold. Timeless wisdom from a man that has survived in the markets for many, many decades and generated fantastic returns, okay? A lot of the returns were in the credit market too. So you generally have a, a smaller upside and have to be fanatical about monitoring your downside. The first thing I wish to point out is the difference between secular and cyclical trends. These uh, straight upward diagonal lines here over longer periods of time, that would be considered the secular trend, okay? From T0 or the starting time 
to TF or, or the final uh, point in time that you wish to over which you wish to measure that is the secular trend okay however markets behave irrationally all the time so this is a cyclical trend in a secular bull market secular bull market uh, are increasing on the average over time but they can be decreasing at uh, any two points on the curve as you can see here so that can be for any number of reasons our portfolio might be down uh, in price says absolutely nothing about the the value expected for our stocks over time so if we're in secular secular bull industries okay commodities energy uh, agriculture and so on and so forth some of the tech space still uh, we might be down on the month but we're we're going to ride those tailwinds over the the secular bull market okay ideally in an ideal world we buy at the lows sell at the highs but don't forget sentiments at its best right at the top of the cyclical uh, cycle okay the cyclical trend and so what what we need to get our heads around is we need to listen to our gut and most of the time do the exact opposite okay when things look terrible and everyone's worried and we we see red on our accounts we go ah we need to take a deep breath analyze what's happened have any of the fundamentals of the businesses in which we are invested changed if the answer is no another word for a, a crash or a sell-off is a sale okay if you think about it, you go to the the grocery store and your favorite uh, bread is on sale okay it, it dropped 50 percent. it crashed well it's a sale in that case okay as long as there's nothing wrong with the bread it's a good deal and we should buy more than when the bread is more expensive okay but for some reason that logic goes out the window a lot of the times when people invest in uh, in capital markets easy to say not easy to do to keep a lid on your emotions i do understand here we have uh, another very simple um, representation of, of a concept. We've got our risk here on the X axis and return is represented as F of X. Secular trend is uh, the, the market at the moment in markets that are generally uh, growing in uh, places with growing GDP. The market will eventually track the GDP here we have the benchmark so let's say this is the s p 500 okay this is the amount of return this is the amount of risk so we weren't in cash we weren't in you know gold or whatever the case might be considered as uh, less risk than equities we're in the equity market our benchmark is the s p 500 and that's the return that we've got where you see uh, a lot of the fund managers making the financial news is when they outperform to the upside. So if the S&P gives us 10% on the year, let's say, and we smash it, we make 80% on the year, uh, which uh, a lot of those investors that I mentioned at the start of the video, last year they had phenomenal years, 50, 60, even 80% on the upside. Yes, that was based off low base effects due to COVID, but let's give credit where credit's due. They outperformed and did very well. We're continuing to outperform them, but I haven't gotten the credit for it yet because we're still uh, on the defensive side, okay? So this is the easy one to get uh, your head around and understand outperformance uh, or alpha. So the difference between these two points is the value added by your fund manager, okay? So if you're invested in crisis funds, I'm your hedge fund manager. If I outperform the market, this is the alpha that I have added to your investment, okay? What's not so easy to understand is if we have uh, this chart here, this is our benchmark, everything else is the same, except our returns only match the S&P. So let's say we only get 10% uh, on the year and the S&P returns 10%. You think to yourself, well, you know, why would I take the, the risk investing in the hedge fund when I could have just bought the index? Good question. Well, what if I told you that we didn't invest in equities um, hardly at all, which are more risky, we made 10% off the credit market, so corporate credit and buying up the bonds, buying uh, or selling, you know, going long, short, whatever the case might be, we were trading the treasury market, which is um, basically considered uh, no risk. Well, if we took far less risk, but we got the same reward, then that is also considered alpha, or the risk-adjusted returns were outsized, okay? Risk and return are kind of, you know, 
two brothers in the same family, if you want to look at it that way, two sides of the, the same coin. So the difference between the two dots here would also be considered alpha. What you can see, I don't have a chart for this, but you are going to get the, the idea now. What would happen if the, this was in negative territory? And for example, if we, if we go back, pretend that zero is not here and I move the zero line up to say, you know, halfway between the two or even above the two points. And let's say our portfolio did negative 1% and the benchmark did negative 4.8%, which it did on the month, okay? So our performance, our alpha, we generated, uh, in this case, 3.8% of alpha, but both were negative in the absolute. So if zero line is at the top here, we were negative 1%, okay? Marked to market, we haven't sold anything, so we haven't, they're paper losses only. And but for the, the purpose of demonstration, if the benchmark came in mark to market at negative 4.8%, the alpha is 3.8%, we, we've smashed it, okay? But you, it's not as easy to see, and that's what I wish to point out. Uh, the last, I believe, of the, the graph as shared by Mr. Marx, very important, okay? So let's have a look. Here's our, our zero on the, the X scale is returned now, so we flipped it, and relative probability is F of X on the vertical axis. If the market in the solid line there generates a positive return and we lag it then there's no point in paying a hedge fund manager not that you guys pay me eToro pays me but that's not the point there's no point taking the extra risk if you could have just bought the market you could have just bought the s p and outperformed so this is a negatively skilled investor as represented by this curve if we come down here or let's let's go over here, this would be outperforming on the upside. So if you've got a skilled, aggressive investor, when things are going well, the market does well, it returns a certain amount, and the investor or the fund manager does better, obviously alpha would be represented in the space between the two lines there. But don't forget on the downside, the hedge fund manager might lose more than if you had invested in the market. So if they're an overly aggressive investor, when things are going well, that's all well and good but they may not protect your downside as much when the market conditions start to turn. Coming down here, bottom left, here we have a skilled investor, okay? They have taken or they have kept up with almost all of the gains of the market on the upside. So they're not quite as good as the, the S&P or whatever benchmark you're using, but they also saved you a hell of a lot of the downsides. So that might be a very skilled um credit investor or bond investor perhaps that when equities are going well bonds generally won't perform as well or that they won't perform as well uh, but when things get bad people rush to the safety of treasuries for example so they may protect your downside if we go to the bottom right this is a highly skilled investor and the reason is i'm sure you figured out by now they have outperformed the market on the upside a generated alpha and they have captured less of the downside Okay, so the market is down here and they've lost a lot less than the market in the, the downturn, the bad times. And obviously here they've outperformed uh, the performance of the market when th the going was good, as it were. So these are really important concepts to understand, okay? That's what I've got going through my brain and that's what you as investors, I, I really want to educate you and understand the, uh, so that you understand the process of what we're trying to achieve. You know, I personally am not looking to double my money or your your money in a week, okay? It'd be nice if it happens and we'll take it, but I'll be taking it off the table and rolling it into other uh, positions as part of a diversified portfolio. This is where we need to have a little bit of patience, a little bit of discipline and think long-term, playing the long game, how do we um, emulate the results of this highly skilled investor in the bottom right column? Okay, September, let's talk about what happened. Uh, if you watched last month's update, I said I was going to increase the beta, okay? We were slightly up on last month. We avoided a lot of the downturns, okay, or the drawdowns, but we didn't quite keep up with the, the market. So I was representing maybe the skilled defensive investor, and where I recognized I could do better is if I increased the portfolio beta. So we were below one. Uh, I've done that. I've increased the portfolio beta. It was at about 1.1, which is quite high. That would suggest, all else being equal, that as the S&P rises uh, by one point, we will beat that by 
So if we have, uh, and this speaks to again the, the outperformance, if we have a high beta, but we've captured less on the downside in a negative month, this month I, I've performed um, in line with the highly skilled investor, okay? So increased uh, upside is expected and increased volatility uh, because we have the, the increased beta. Uh, I've already talked about, uh, still we outperform the benchmark uh, with less downside and I've increased our, our weighting in the beta. So uh, when the market starts to run, we will, we will expect to outperform. Used cash to avoid high, uh, to add to high convictions and diversify. Uh, so I, I added in and, and bought a few new positions. We also hold 2% in cash still. So we're, we've got that in our uh, back pocket ready to deploy if we find some real bargains. I sold Facebook at a profit. Uh, dodgy news with Facebook. Um, they had a, a lawsuit issued around insider trading allegations. It, it looked quite ugly. You had uh, the people on the docket were basically a who's who of Silicon Valley. So I don't know how this will play out. It could all be, be nothing, I don't know. But I decided to take the profits off the table. We're completely out of the position. I'm hugely bullish on Facebook in the longer term. I'm hoping for the stock to crash so that we can go in and buy it. But for now, we're just keeping an eye on things. Profits were also taken. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, it's a great business still. I just think that there are better growth opportunities. I went short on the Chinese bank, Minchen. Okay, so with the Evergrande fiasco in my personal account, I shorted Evergrande, made a good amount of money as it dropped. If you don't know what short selling is, you borrow someone's shares, sell uh, those shares at the high, in theory, you hope that the stock drops so that you then um, buy back the shares. So instead of buying low and selling high, you're, in a nutshell, selling high and buying back low, okay? Uh, we made profits on Vale. I've now re-entered the position. So we played that beautifully. We sold Vale at a profit. We then uh, allowed the, uh, the iron ore crash to occur thanks to Evergrande in, in China, and now the company is extremely cheap. They may have further downside. We've just eked in a little position, and I'll be looking to continue to build out positions in Vale and also Rio Tinto. Samsung, Amazon, same deal. Uh, Samsung, we exited, Samsung, we en exited completely uh, at a profit. Amazon, we just scaled back a little bit, just trimmed the, the position. Got out of T row price. Not that it's a bad business. I just think that that money could be better better used elsewhere uh, with changing environments. And so we're out of T row. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it. Out of polymetal. I'm looking into um, more the major uh, metal producers. So we took a small loss on those because I believe the opportunity cost is in uh, is too great in other areas of the market. The portfolio construction is working. And um, so we had our top two positions uh, down over 10%, which is never good, and yet we still outperform the market. And uh, as I'll show in the, the next slide, this was thanks to the way the portfolio has been constructed uh, with the, the tail end having a convexity bias uh, with some leverage. So what I'll do is just head into the next slide here. Do you remember when I launched the fund and uh, I was talking about the way the portfolio would be constructed? What I mean by the tail wagging is those uh, little plays down here on this end of the, the curve that had a smaller weighting attached, they have outperformed, okay? So our bigger plays, our um, Royal Mail and also Discovery uh, is down at almost 10%, if not 10%, it's almost 10%. And so that's obviously a drag on the performance, but these little fellas have done their job by outperforming. So I've used less equity, okay, less cash to buy these positions and I've leveraged them up. So I've used sort of two or five times leverage um, for these specific plays. Don't always use leverage because it's a double-edged sword, uh, but in this case, it's worked beautifully and done exactly what it's supposed to do. And we also use some hedge positions, okay? So I sold short some of the companies that I mentioned earlier so that in, in a falling market, we'll actually capture the spread, okay? Which is something I'll need to keep an eye on because October, I believe, is gonna have a heap of volatility. Okay, here we go. Looking into October, the opportunities are in the energy and uh, certain commodities sector. As I've said numerous times, expect volatility. I expect a lot of volatility in October. We've got um, the Fed Open Market Committee in the US has just uh, occurred. There's all sorts of talk about tapering. Uh, 
I can't get into it too much because this video has already come up on 25 minutes, but basically the way interest rates have been suppressed is that the Federal Reserve, the central banks around the world, uh, issuing funds to buy up bonds. When you buy up bonds, the price gets bidded up and price and yield are in inverse uh, relationships. So the yields drop, which is the interest rates, they drop as the prices rise. So we've got this artificial buying. The Fed is saying eventually they have to stop, um, if they can, they're going to slow the pace at which they um, are buying these bonds. Okay, This is known as quantitative easing. So they are saying they're going to ease the rate at which they're quantitatively easing. And uh, so we'll see what happens. If interest rates start to rise, that usually acts as gravity on asset prices in the equity space. So what I'll be looking at very closely is if the 10-year, okay, the, the IEF and the 20-year the US Treasuries yield starts to rise, we will profit from that by shorting those positions. So I will be selling them short with some leverage as a hedge so that if interest rates rise and some of our tech stocks drop um, as they'll be reevaluated on the, the rising interest rates, then we should hedge out some of that risk. I'm not going to look to hedge out all of it, but it will smooth some of the volatility is what I'm, I'm hoping. Is there going to be a late precious metals run? Uh, the options market seem to think so. Uh, listening to Ronnie Sterfele from um, Incrementum, he has said that the, um, the options pricing in the precious metals market and the derivatives are pricing in a, a massive run. So it could happen, but who knows? Um, I'm not banking on it. I think that, again, the difference between that cyclicality and the secular trends what we need to keep in mind. Secular trend, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, precious metals have to run up, okay? With the amount of currency that's created, and um, the inflation rates, yields, real yields are negative, and so investors are going to look for ways to preserve wealth, and precious metals are um, one of the best ways to do that. Currencies that will benefit, I think the British pound will hold up, the euro, uh, the Aussie dollar, once this fiasco of COVID is over, should strengthen. Um, but right now the economy is, you know, it's going, <laughs> it's basically a snail over here because things are, are suffering from lockdown. Copper is something I'm trying to build out an exposure to. Uh, I wasn't really on the ball with copper earlier this year. I should have bought more and didn't, uh, but I'm looking to oil. We are well positioned in and natural gas we are. I think they're going to continue to run. If there's a, a mishap in the commodity space, I will try and get as uh, much exposure to copper as I deem reasonable value. Okay. Okay. There we go. A uh, little bit longer format, but I, I hope that helps educate you in terms of what uh, I'm trying to achieve with the fund and if you're interested in investing because you like the way that we roll and you um, are that rare individual that can actually spot outperformance even in a downturn then I'll leave a link there click on the link and you can uh, see the portfolio and add funds to the uh, copy of the portfolio if you haven't already liked and subscribe to YouTube. I would really appreciate you doing that so that the algorithm will continue to get more of these videos out there. And if you have a question or if you have a, a, a business or a, a stock that you'd like me to analyze, uh, leave me a comment and I'll do my best, no promises, but I will do my best to, to try and fit it in there. Thank you for watching and as always, do your own due diligence and don't listen to everything you hear on the internet or everything that you listen to you should take with a, a grain of salt okay so be sensible guys be safe with your capital all right uh, and i hope to see you in the next video wishing you all the best with your investments take care we'll see you soon